get this show on the road. Yeah. 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 Okay, so I would like to introduce our two guest speakers today. Um, Michael Abrash and Bill Katz from Oculus. Uh, Michael is the chief scientist at Oculus. As of how long? Um, you probably have used a piece of software that Michael has written at some point, whether or not you were playing Quake. Or using Windows, Michael's the lead developer for GPI. I've been for a while. Uh, Michael's actually really instrumental. We know him all very well in graphics because he has this big black book, which is probably the largest book that has ever been published in computer science almost. It's like the Bible for uh, hardcore low level optimization in graphics. And uh, Zelda is actually one of our own. He was earlier here as a PhD, uh, sorry, as a postdoc, and then did you go directly to Oculus from CMU? And I was uh, you know, leading a lot of the computer vision research. So I will turn the floor over to them. Um, you know, as I was talking to, to Michael on the phone a couple weeks ago, he's like, there's all these great problems that we have to solve and we don't know how to solve them. And he would like to get a lot of smart people thinking about these types of problems. So that's why we invited him here to talk to you. So. Great, thanks. Is this working? Oh, okay. Great. <laughs> uh, well, hello. Um, I've been talking to people all day. My throat's a little hoarse. I apologize if I end up clearing it, but I'll do my best. So today, I'll be talking about why VR matters much more than almost anyone thinks right now, and how that's likely to affect researchers and engineers in particular. And the short version of that is that it could be one of the biggest research and development opportunities in our lifetime. Um, and I do want to mention that Dove's going to talk after me. After that, we'll do Q&A. But after that, Dove will let people try out the next Rift development kit. And, uh, that may take us a while, because you can only do one person at a time, but we're happy to uh, give you people that opportunity. So I'm excited to be giving this talk, and to be honest, I'm a little nervous. I've been working out the model of what VR really is about and why it matters for two years now, and this is the first time I've talked about it in public. Um, I'm not very familiar with this talk yet, and I want to make sure I get all the nuances right. So at times, I will probably simply have to read parts of it to make sure I do get it right. So please bear with me, and I appreciate any feedback after the talk. <coughs> so there's been a lot of talk lately, thanks to Oculus, Sony, and especially Facebook, about how VR is likely to be the next big platform. When Mark Zuckerberg says about VR that, <coughs> quote, there aren't many things that have the potential to be the next big computing platform, and then spends $2 billion to back that up, it's a powerful statement. That's gratifying to hear, and it's kind of astonishing considering that a couple of year, years ago, VR was all but dead and buried. But I think it actually understates the true significance. The advent of consumer VR that can induce presence, I'll talk about presence in a moment, marks nothing less than a phase change in the relationship between humans, computing, and information. In fact, in a very real sense, VR is the last platform. That's a big claim, I know. And it's a hard one to properly substantiate in this talk because it rests on the concept of presence, which I'll define as the sense that you truly are in a virtual world. Here's a way to think of presence. The suspension of disbelief is a well-known key to novels and movies. Think of presence as inverting that, requiring active suspension of belief in order to remember that the virtual world isn't real because your perceptual system is telling you that it is. I can't define presence any better than that, in the words of Supreme Court Justice Potter Stewart, I know it when I see it, although he wasn't talking about VR. <laughs> <coughs> That's not a cop-out on my part, though. It's inherent in the essence of presence, which is specifically about directly engaging the perceptual system in the way that it's evolved to interact with the real world. The only way to grasp how presence changes everything is to experience it, and the only place to experience it is in VR, which I largely can't show you today, although you can definitely try the DK2 demo, which is getting close. Um, I'm going to do my best today to use words to convey to you why presence is so significant, but for the purposes of this talk, just take my word for it. It's true. So I'm going to start by retracing the evolution of my thinking about VR. It would be fair to say it started when I read <coughs> Snow Crash and saw the leaked alpha of Doom. Taken together, they made VR seem less like a magic far-off technology and more like an engineering problem. But it wasn't until about two and a half years ago at Valve that my path to VR really gathered steam as I started thinking about what the next big platform might be and quickly zeroed in on augmented reality. It was obvious to me at the time that really good AR would replace tablets and phones. It's the logical endpoint of the progression from PC to laptop to notebook to tablet and phone, where at every step, information has become more readily available in more places. 
And in fact, I still believe that's true. At the time, I thought of VR as at best a niche technology, a sidetrack on the way to AR. I thought it might be a useful sidetrack in that it would share a lot of technology with AR, but nothing more than that. AR enhances your interaction with the real world. VR shuts out the real world. To me, that made it clear AR's impact was potentially much greater. Over the next year, several things shifted my thinking. One was Palmer, Lucky, and Oculus resurrecting VR from the trash heap of history. <coughs> a, uh, another one was reading Ready Player One, which helped me understand just how powerful the range of VR experiences could be and made me realize how many of the problems involved in making VR work were actually quite tractable. And the last factor was realizing that many of the problems involved in making AR work were actually not tractable, at least in the next few years. So the team at Valve decided <coughs> to shift its focus to VR. Along the way, I tried a Rift DK DK1. It was cool, it was immersive, but the combination of tracking, display, and system characteristics wasn't good enough yet to make me think that VR was compelling. The same was true for a series of prototypes, each improved, but none of them capable of convincing me that VR was the future. That didn't come until last August in the form of a very specific experience that is exhibit number one for my claim that VR is more than just the next big platform. That experience came in the Valve demo room using the same technology that people blogged about, about Steam after Steam Dev Days. You can see a description of the capabilities of that system on my Valve blog. I believe it's possible to build an equivalent consumer system within the next two years. The experience consisted of standing on a ledge over a deep pit. The ledge was textured with a stone image that looked straight out of doom. The pit was textured with a screenshot of a Yahoo page announcing that Yahoo was about to go public, uh, Facebook was about to go public. There was no lighting and I had no visible body. In short, the rendering quality was in no way realistic. On the other hand, the head tracking was extremely accurate. The display was low persistence and adequately high resolution. The optics were well calibrated and the end-to-end -end latency was very low. As soon as I looked down, my knees locked up. I'm not fond of heights, and that reaction was exactly the same as when I looked down off the Empire State Building. I stood on the ledge for several minutes, waiting to see if the effect would wear off. It didn't. When I finally made myself step off that ledge, there was a moment just before my foot landed on the carpet when, even though I knew I was in a demo room, even though I was wearing a headset, even though the scene looked like the crude prototype that it was, I had a very strong feeling that I was making a terrible mistake, that I was about to fall a long way. It was at that moment that I truly started to understand the importance of VR. I should note at this point that a ledge or beam scenario that makes people uncomfortable is an old VR staple. So you might well question how significant my experience was. However, most versions accomplish this by making people feel off balance or afraid of falling due to imperfect tracking and or high latency and or imperfect calibration, all of which will indeed induce a feeling of unease and instability, but not due to presence. In the case of the Valve demo, however, all of those elements were well-tuned and the scene was very stable. My discomfort resulted from the overwhelming sense that I was perched on a very real ledge in front of a very real drop. It was hard to convince myself that I was safe in a carpeted room. This is what I meant earlier when I said that presence requires suspension of belief in order to remember that the virtual world isn't real. OK, I'm going to switch threads for a bit, but I <coughs> promise this will tie in. Assuming a properly functioning brain, our perception of reality is based on a set of inputs sent by peripheral processors such as the retina, the cochlea, and so on. If those processors receive data that fit their parameters, and if the resulting transmissions from the various processors collectively allow the brain to make a coherent model of the world, then the result is perceived as real. If not, then the result is perceived as artificial. It can still contain useful information, but the in that information is not part of the world. Here we come to the crux of my claim that VR is a phase change in the way we interact with technology. For a very long time, humans have been piggybacking abstract information signals on our basic mammalian input channels, then decoding them into internal mental models. Words piggyback on the auditory system, spoken language, radio recordings. Words also come in through the visual system in the form of written <coughs> language. Images that symbolize certain aspects of reality piggyback on the visual system as well. Drawings, photographs, TVs, movies, video games. This is obviously a very powerful capability, certainly key to the stunning success of humanity, since the sum total of human knowledge has been transmitted in this way. But it's not what our perceptual system evolved to do. 
Language, movies, all the rest are late addition. And as such, they don't engage most of the perceptual system's capabilities. And here we finally arrive at the key point, because VR that induces presence does engage those capabilities, and that makes all the difference. As I said at the start, there's really no way to understand the difference other than to experience presence, precisely because the difference is perceptual, not intellectual, but I'll try to give you an idea of what I'm talking about. As I said, exhibit number one is my experience on the ledge. If I'd looked at a picture of a ledge, or seen a movie of a ledge, I would have been intellectually aware of the situation, but I wouldn't have thought I was in it. However, because the information from my eyes, combined with the motion of my head, caused several, though by no means all, of my peripheral processors to send the right signals, my lizard brain was able to construct a consistent model of the world, and suddenly a host of systems fired up that had never before been triggered by artificial input. My knees locked up, my body tensed, my heart rate increased, and when I stepped forward, an emergency alarm went off to inform me that I was in dire peril. In fact, in short, as far as my perceptual system below the conscious level was concerned, I was, quite literally, in that virtual world. Consciously, I knew that wasn't true, but most of our experience of reality isn't based on conscious thought. A tremendous amount of perceptual processing occurs below the conscious level, and we become aware of the results as emotions or feelings or things we just know without thinking about them. Often, conscious thought is bypassed entirely, and we only become aware of the processing after the fact. Another example that illustrates the unconscious belief in the virtual world is a VR demo in which I was standing in a room with pipes hanging off the ceiling. I wanted to see what a far corner looked like, so I walked that way, and without thinking, ducked my head under a virtual pipe. Again, it's hard to demonstrate what I'm talking about without using VR, but I'll ask Dove to come up here to help me give a very simple demo. Come on up. <clears throat> First, I'm going to read you something, then I'll ask you a few questions about it. I take my key fob out of my pocket. It has a big clump of keys on it with a small black flashlight, a TSA-approved Leatherman, and an orange whistle. I toss it gently towards Dove, and I can see the keys glinting and hear them rattling. He reaches out with his hands and catches the keys. Okay, what was on the key fob besides keys? <laughs> flashlight. Well, close enough. <laughs> <laughs> what did I do with the keys? Uh, tossed me towards them. What did you do? Uh, I don't remember. I think I tried to catch them. But Can you visualize what happened? Sort of, yeah. Okay. Now let's. So I've conveyed <laughs> a lot of abstract information to you, piggybacked on your uh, auditory system, and you've mapped it into an internal model mm -hmm. of the event. That's how all current media and communications work. Now let's do this. Look at this up. <laughs> That wasn't the same as listening to the passage, was it? No. Everything that went into catching the keys, tracking it with your eyes, calculating the trajectory, moving your hands, the coordination required to make all that work, happened below the conscious level. Mm -hmm. You didn't read or hear about an experience. You had an experience. Thanks. <laughs> it wasn't practice, by the way. I actually <laughs> thought about reading something that said, I throw my keys as hard as I can at him. <laughs> but I didn't think that would really be very nice. <clears throat> And that's how presence works. You have an experience. If enough of your perceptual system is convinced, then as far as everything below the conscious level is concerned, it happened. Your conscious mind can know better, and it can argue with that, but as I learned on that ledge, it's an uphill battle, because instinct, emotion, and things you just know without thinking are the ways in which you experience the world. The magic of presence is that for the first time, enough of your perceptual system is stimulated correctly so that you believe you're teleported to some other place, which in terms of your own experience, means for all practical purposes that you are some other place. There are other more powerful examples that I thought I could <coughs> illustrate this difference, but none seemed appropriate for the setting. For example, I thought I could have shown you a movie of a tiger coming into a room filled with people and then let a live tiger loose in here. Um, I can guarantee you that your reaction to the live tiger would have engaged more of your perceptual system. By now it should be evident why trying to explain VR this way is unsatisfying and contradictory. The whole point of VR that enables presence is that it engages the perceptual system well enough to deliver what feels like a real experience, as opposed to traditional media, which convey descriptions of experiences. But of course, I'm using a traditional medium to try to describe the magic of VR, which is bound to fall short. It's like trying to explain color to someone who's been blind since birth. The concept and the experience are one and the same. The bottom line is that VR isn't just another platform. 
it's information interfaced directly to our perceptual system, the way the perceptual system is built to be driven. That's why I say it's a phase change. It's an entirely different and more powerful mode of interaction. As evidence of that, it's impossible using traditional media to show what VR is like. In contrast, given sufficiently good VR, it would be easy to simulate any traditional medium. If you want to sit in a theater uh, in VR and watch a movie, there's already an app for that. If you wanted to play a virtual video game or work at a virtual monitor, those are clearly possible as well. VR is simply bigger than traditional media. In the limit, it's as big as reality. In fact, it's actually much bigger than reality, since it can also include infinitely many experiences that can't exist in the real world. My guess at this point is that you're thinking, it's an interesting line of thought, but I've drunk too much of my own Kool-Aid. And uh, obviously, I am very excited about the potential of VR. <coughs> But my prediction is that you'll retain that skepticism right up until the moment you use a VR system that induces presence and have your own equivalent of looking off a ledge, and then you'll understand. It's that powerful. And really, how could being teleported to a place that doesn't even exist not be? So that's why VR isn't the next uh, big platform. It's something bigger. I may or may not have convinced you, but believe me, something big is on the way. The interesting question now is what that implies. The range of possible effects of VR that enables presence is vast. And as with any significant technologies, there will be both positive and negative effects, most of which will be unexpected. I'm not even going to try to guess what they'll be, with one exception. I predict that VR will be the most social medium ever. Given that VR involves strapping on a head-mounted display and shutting out the world, you'd think that the opposite would be true. But when I was at Valve, I did a simple experiment that was very revealing. All it consisted of was a virtual room and two people with headsets. Only heads were tracked, so each person consisted of just a cube with a smiley face that I drew in paint pasted on the front. One time, I was the first person in the room. The other person hadn't yet picked up their headset, so their head was a box sitting on the floor. When they did pick up the headset to put it on, it rose in a straight line. It was obviously still a box being lifted. Then it did a short arc, and then all of a sudden, it was a person. When they stood up, it was eerie how I just knew it was a person standing up. As social creatures, we are incredibly tuned to each other's body cues. And once again, this happens almost entirely below the conscious level. Now, imagine that we have VR with excellent head tracking, eye tracking, facial tracking, hand tracking, and body tracking, and that we can effectively use all that to drive an avatar. In that case, my guess is that when you're in a virtual space with someone's avatar, you will feel like you're with another person. In fact, it will quite likely be hyper-real. Think of how anime characters' eyes are bigger than any real person's. Apply that principle to avatars, and I think VR will eventually feature the most expressive social interactions that have ever occurred. And you'll be able to have those interactions with anyone at any distance. Tracking is just one of the many branches of the VR technology tree, all of them offering challenges far into the future. Input hardware is one obvious next step. Interaction with the virtual world based on that input hardware is another. Input leads directly to haptics, and the kind of haptics that VR needs, not just rumbling and buzzing, but the sense of touching and manipulating real things, is huge, a huge and largely unsolved area that's a critical piece of the puzzle in the long term. It's a powerful experience to see and interact with an object that looks real, but it's far more powerful to actually feel it as you interact with it. The key here is that haptic feedback completes a perceptual loop. You see an object, you initiate action to touch and manipulate it, and you receive feedback confirming both the visual input and the motor action. These sorts of loops are at the core of presence. Getting the feedback loop between head motion and visual input, which results in parallax among other things, working correctly was critical to the Valve's prototype ability, prototype's ability to induce presence. Haptics is powerful not only because of the feedback loop, but also because of the correspondence between touch and vision. Such correspondences are very important. For example, if both vision and audio report that something is in a particular place, that will be far more convincing than vision alone. So properly propagated and spatialized audio is another area of VR that will require a great deal of research. In fact, I was recently talking with an audio researcher who was facing the problem that the spatial quality of his audio had gotten so good that he couldn't properly evaluate its perceptual impact without good VR. Because without the excellent tracking and matching visuals needed to engage the perceptual mechanisms that humans routinely use to localize and interpret sounds, people were actually unable to perceive the difference in quality. This is an example of how VR is going to not only open up new areas of research, but also give new impetus to existing areas. 
It's easy to see how that applies to haptics and tracking, but it also applies to many areas of human biology and perception that you wouldn't automatically associate with VR. There's a great deal of research to be done regarding which perceptual cues are essential and which can be discarded. And just as important, which miscues need to be avoided. It's obvious that perceptual psychology and human factors will be relevant for this, but disciplines such as neurobiology will also be needed. In order to master the process of directly driving a perceptual system, we're eventually going to have to know exactly how the perceptual system works. Even an area as narrow as how the fingertips sense pressure and shear is likely to become important as haptics advances. And knowledge of how to generate a wide, ra wide range of sense from a limited chemical palette could result in the equivalent of the inkjet printer for the sense of smell. By this point, it should be obvious that VR will open up a mother load of research and engineering opportunities. Back in the 70s and 80s, graphics was wide open with lots of low-hanging fruit, rasterization, alpha blending, the fundamental equation of ray tracing. VR is at the point where graphics was when hardware first managed to render a single triangle in real time, and the research and development for VR will be like graphics squared. It's easy for me to rattle off head, eye, face, hand, and body tracking. Um, as key VR technologies. Actually figuring out how to do all of those at room scale will create rewarding careers for many researchers. And making them work at very low latency with no perceptible glitches or inaccuracies, and almost all glitches and inaccuracies are perceptible in VR. And with consumer price and reliability will create many rewarding careers for engineers. In fact, 3D graphics is one area that will be kicked into hyperdrive by VR. Let's take a deeper look at how VR will disrupt graphics, which is currently a mature field featuring steady but incremental improvement. For starters, VR requires stereo rendering at at least 90 hertz, roughly six times the effective frame rate of current games. And unlike games, VR can't <coughs> afford to miss any frames or else artifacts result. VR also requires a field of view around 100 degrees and preferably more. So in order to get the same pixel density per degree as a desktop monitor, a head-mounted display would need resolution of about 10K by 10K. 25 times as many pixels as a desktop monitor, and even more to reach retinal resolution. VR would also benefit from high dynamic range rendering, increasing both bandwidth and shading requirements. Finally, VR requires significantly higher rendering quality than current games. Scenes that look great in a game look like cheesy stage sets in VR. New techniques will be required as well. For example, geometric detail works better than texture mapping, and bump <coughs> mapping doesn't work at all. This impacts every part of the graphics pipeline. GPU performance will have to increase by at least two and more likely three orders of magnitude, and emphasis will have to shift towards increased geometry. Transmission links to displays will have to support the vastly increased pixel load. And even more challenging, those links will eventually have to become wireless. Displays will have to evolve to handle 100 megapixels or more with densities of several thousand pixels per inch and support HDR. Optics will have to display those pixels clearly across an enormous field of view with a large eye box, and calibration techniques will have to evolve to support the optics. And that's just the hardware side. Art and animation will have to be completely rethought for VR, and rendering engines and content creation tools will have to change to match. Basically, every aspect of graphics as we know it will have to be revamped or reinvented. I focused on graphics because that's what I know best, but similar levels of R&D will be needed in every area that touches VR, including but certainly not limited to computer vision, locomotion, interface design, presentation, motion sickness, ergonomics, ambient <coughs> awareness, social interaction, and of course, VR experiences themselves, which are the whole point and interact with everything else. And of course, somewhere down the line, there will be AR as well. The many branches of VR technology will continue to evolve for a very long time. A grad student who starts working on VR haptics today could well be working on far more refined haptics when they're 60. Not one of the areas I've discussed is currently solvable in the sense that it's possible to see a concrete path to making it work as well as you'd really want it to work or anywhere close. But in every case, there are many promising ways to push the state of the art forward rapidly, often with potentially spectacular results. The first prototype that enables people to reach out and physically touch a virtual object will not only be the star of academic conferences, but will also most likely be on the cover of Wired. Now, it's true that past VR research didn't pay off because the industry failed to ignite. What's different this time is that a critical mass of elements have come together to enable presence at a consumer price, including cell phone panels with low persistence and high resolution, wide field of view optics with GPU-based warping, inexpensive gyroscopes and accelerometers, inexpensive global shutter cameras, low overall system latency, and teraflop GPUs. 
I can't guarantee VR will take off this time, but the elements for success are in place, and with them come huge R&D opportunities. The opportunities are particularly compelling because VR research and development is wide open right now. Because the VR industry <coughs> failed to take off in the past, and because there was no way of investigating or demonstrating VR, except on extremely expensive limited systems, there are whole areas of VR that have barely been touched. Of course, that also means that the integrated set of expertise necessary to fulfill VR's potential doesn't exist yet either. At Oculus, we strongly believe in both the long-term importance of VR and the need for a great deal of research and development. That's why we're starting up an R&D facility near Seattle. To be honest, I don't know what the roadmap will be for figuring out all the hard VR problems. That's why it's research, not development. Our approach is to build a diverse team of leading edge researchers across the spectrum from graphics to haptics to human factors to psychology to optics, combined with first-rate hardware engineers, programmers, and facilities, build a critical mass of interacting skills around solving VR, and start prototyping technologies that look promising over the next five to 10 years. So to sum up, VR is very likely how we're increasingly going to interact with information and with each other in the future. It will get better, but it won't be displaced by the next big platform. It will just drive more and more of our perceptual system directly until eventually it drives the full capability of the perceptual system. And by definition, there is no next platform after that. Even if we all end up jacked into the matrix, it would still just be a refinement, a massive refinement, to be sure, of the Valve prototype. Taken to the logical extreme, which to be clear is very, very far away at best, VR encompasses all possible human experiences. So I think it's fair to call it the, potentially the last platform. There may not be a better opportunity for research, engineering, and changing the relationship between humans and technology in our lifetime. I've worked on a lot of interesting, significant stuff over the last 30 plus years, but this, <coughs> this feels like the biggest one yet. The people in this room are among the fortunate few who are positioned to play significant parts in making VR happen, and I hope many of you will choose to do just that. Next, Dove will talk about our head tracking system. to be here again uh, after you sort of heard our five ten maybe hundred years long vision uh, for virtual reality I'm going to talk about uh, a very limited problem but one of these key problems that you have to solve to get to this sense of presence uh, and it's the problem of uh, tracking the position of the headset of the user uh, during a VR session uh, to understand why this is important uh, think about our product it's essentially a display attached to your face and without tracking your head you just move around with the display, right? You don't actually get any sense of presence. And even if the display was a 3D display, it's kind of like going to, uh, to watch a 3D movie, right? You look forward, you see the movie, you look to the side, there's nothing interesting. And we realized that early on, our first uh, prototype, our uh, DK1, uh, had some limited uh, head tracking, orientation only, so three degrees of freedom. And that meant that if you, you know, hold your, your head still and you, can, you rotate it around without actually translating, you can look around the environment. And this was, you know, it was a, a great experience. The first time I tried our, before even DK1, our very early prototype, I was, you know, it was very exciting and it felt, it felt a little immersive at the time. And then the first thing that I tried to do was, uh, you know, move forward, look at an object, right, or look behind an object, and it didn't work. And it took me maybe five minutes to convince myself that it doesn't work because some motions were tracked and others weren't. And then after five minutes, I also started feeling a little sick because you know, my, your brain expects to see something and it doesn't really happen. And so we realized that this was one of the important challenges for us to solve early on. Our second developer kit, with, which I'll demo later and we're currently starting to build, we'll start shipping it to customers uh, early this summer, has full six degrees of freedom tracking. And Again, just like uh, all the other things that Michael mentioned, this is ver still very early days for this technology. It's using an external camera, looking at the headset. Uh, we only consider a seated VR experience, uh, so very limited tracking volume. But it gets us one step closer to uh, this sense of, of, uh, of presence. Um, when we set up to solve this problem, there were two, uh, two important challenges for us to deal with. The first one is precision. Uh, you'd be surprised how good your brain is at estimating the way we move. Uh, if you're moving your head on a straight line and in VR we render the scene as if, it moved, as if you moved on a curve, it doesn't feel right. And it immediately breaks that sense of presence. 
Uh, and the other challenge is latency, uh, this notion of going from motion to photons. Uh, from the moment your brain commands a certain uh, translation or rotation of the head to having some sensor track in that motion, compute the actual pose change of your head, and rendering the new image, this, this entire loop is your perceived latency. Uh, and there are some tricks we can do to shorten that loop, but overall we need to make all the components faster so that you don't actually sense that latency. Uh, long latency means that you move and the response is delayed and therefore again, no sense of presence. So how do we solve this problem? Uh, sorry, one more thing to mention, that's the practical side, not the 10 years research uh, plan. Once we started to design the product, we had all the engineers come and say, well, you know, we know you know how to solve the problem with a super expensive tracking system, but we have to use a sensor that costs only five bucks. And we have to build something robust. So if you drop the headset on the floor, it has to keep working. Uh, and it can be too heavy. Uh, and it has to, to work in different lighting conditions and work with occlusion because some people just like to put stickers on their headset. Uh, so, you know, all these challenges that make, that create an engineering challenge on top of, of the science. Our solution, uh, like I already mentioned, was to use an external camera, and this, I can show you, this is how our DK2 camera looks like. So pretty simple webcam that you can put on any monitor. And, and drop. <laughs> and a headset that looks like this. So it doesn't look uh, too remarkable. It's relatively, uh, speaking, a light headset. No interesting features. Uh, inside this headset, we have uh, 40 infrared LEDs embedded behind the plastic. Uh, and we use these LEDs as markers. The camera is somewhat sensitive to infrared, uh, and you have some information about the specs. So it's a wide VGA sensor, 752 by 480 resolution, so not too high, and it runs at uh, 60 frames per second. All right, the, the two uh, big challenges that we had in terms of developing tracking were first identifying these markers. Once we know uh, which marker is which, and uh, mind you, they all appear in the images, just bright dots, right? Uh, once we know that, we can go back to our 3D model, to our manufacturing model, and try to estimate the right pose of the headset in space that explains our observation. This is uh, two examples of how the front of the headset looks in you know, a, st a standard image, and you can see a bunch of uh, points. And if you look closely, you'll see that they have uh, different brightness levels. Uh, what we're doing is actually a pretty, a pretty neat trick. We're uh, modulating the LEDs, the brightness of the LEDs over time. Uh, and here's an example of two values, high and low. You can see that they look pretty different, but uh, this looks a little easier than the problem actually is because, uh, of course, brightness changes as a function of the incidence angle and distance to the camera, and also uh, motion blur uh, contributes to the problem. But if you can believe that you can track these points over a few frames and you can identify changes in modulation, then all you have is uh, basically a simple Morse code of sorts, and you can decode the uh, individual ad ideas of LEDs. This also lets you deal very well with occlusion. You have no geometric requirements on the position of these LEDs. You just need to see a few of them to identify them and then hopefully use this information to reconstruct the, the pose of the headset in space. Another interesting property is that we can really put them anywhere on the headset. There's no requirements on uh, planarity or uh, collinearity of LEDs or other, other type of geometric constraints that people typically use to uh, make identification of markers easy. All right, uh, and I should also mention there is uh, some technologies that use uh, uh, passive markers. What's nice about active markers is that it increases the distance to the camera quite dramatically, which is important. Uh, and in particular, it gives you a much larger tracking volume. So you, you again, it's more difficult for you to break the sense of presence by exiting the uh, track, that tracked volume. Once we identify the LEDs, we need to solve uh, this reconstruction problem. Uh, and in principle, it seems like a pretty easy problem. You, have, uh, you can look at sets of three points and their projection onto the camera and just try and go back to your 3D model uh, and try and com come back with a rotation and translation that explains this projection. Uh, this works in principle, except that uh, it turns out that just for three points, you can actually have some ambiguity, so there can be multiple solutions. And this also gets amplified by minor problems like uh, you know, noise or wrongly uh, decoding some of the LEDs that happens more frequently than we'd like to. Uh, but overall, this is a, a problem that computer vision researchers know of very well, right? So your standard solution to problems like this is 
to take to to try and reconstruct a lot solve a lot of uh, three point problems like this out of how many uh, points you've identified and then use something like ransack. I'm sure this is the wrong audience to explain ransack to, but I'll just you know briefly say that the idea is that you uh, take all these samples and you create little models. In this example, we're looking for a line model, so we're taking pair, pairs of points and we're tracing. Uh, lines between them, and then the theory is that most of them will sort of uh, uh, relate very closely to the true underlying model, in this case the line. So once you found a bunch of points that agree with a single line, you assume that that's the right model and you can potentially recompute the line model to get an even better fit. That's what you're getting here the, uh, in the three-point uh, reconstruction problem. It's a, a little higher dimensional problem, but it's essentially the same idea. So we go and take all these models, find a subset that explains well a lot of the LEDs and then recompute uh, the pose of the headset. And this seems like a lot of work. We definitely don't want to do this every frame, right? Even though we can do the actual computation in real time, uh, at the very least, tracking and decoding the LEDs takes a bunch of frames. And that goes against everything we said about uh, latency. So instead of doing that, we can take advantage of, uh, of time correlation, the notion of, the notion of tracking. Uh, so the idea here is, is actually pretty intuitive, right? You have, once you've reconstructed the pose of the headset for the first time, uh, you can already have a pretty good guess on where the headset is going to be in the next frame. And so that's a really good starting point. You can essentially project where you expect the markers to be and then match them to your observation. And that's going to work most of the time. It doesn't work quite well when you're moving quickly because then uh, your position changes a lot. But once you've done this uh, twice, you already have uh, uh, the ability to compute velocities from vision. And on top of everything, already from our first developer kit, we have an IMU, an inertial measurement unit in the device, which gives us uh, nice little measurements like uh, uh, linear accelerations and angular velocities. And we can use this information, which we get at a very high frame at uh, about one kilohertz, uh, to predict how or essentially to, uh, to compute how the user moved from the previous camera frame to the current camera frame. It's, if you think about it, it's actually an interesting problem in the sense that the, the image that we're getting is already way in the past, right? By the time we grab the image from the camera, it goes through USB all the way to the computer, it's already been about 16 milliseconds. So the data is pretty old. We have about 16 IMU measurements since the previous frame. So we can do, a, a, you know, we can, we can move quite a bit but if we use this information uh, and take advantage of locality, we can switch to a mode where we just do tracking and don't try to uh, run ransack and pause estimation in every frame, just fit it to our observations. So here's the, the general overview of our system. We already talked about uh, the first part, the identification, doing pause reconstruction, and I just mentioned that uh, using the IMU to enhance prediction frame to frame. Even if we do all of this right, there are still a few fundamental problems that we have to solve. Uh, the first problem has to do with drift. Uh, using just the IMU, we suffer a lot from uh, drift, in particular uh, on the yaw axis. This is just uh, the nature of the sensors that we have in, in cell phones. They're pretty cheap and, uh, and relying on uh, magnetic uh, measurements isn't very reliable. So if you just use the magnetometer to uh, figure out your yaw, it will drift over time. The camera is great in that it helps us correct uh, for yaw. So that's one sort of, sort of drift correction. And then from the other side, we have uh, dr drift or more error in, uh, in understanding the pose of the camera. So the camera is this nice absolute device that gives us the pose of the headset, but we never know whether we mounted the camera flat parallel to the ground, or maybe it's just tilted like that. And we'd like it to work in either case. So that's when we can take advantage of the, uh, of the IMU, of the accelerometer, and try and estimate gravity and compare the results that we're getting from the IMU to what the camera says, and then align them uh, together. So that's one problem. Uh, another, another interesting problem that this entire system uh, has is, uh, again, dealing with latency, because like I said, by the time we have the image and we analyze it, it's been at least 16 milliseconds for our 60 frames per second camera. And then uh, it takes us currently about two or three milliseconds to process the data and have some, uh, some estimation for the pose, we want to do something about these 20 milliseconds. And I should add, on top of that, there's uh, some amount of time that takes to render the image, right? So the way, the way to minimize this, uh, this latency 
is to do some predictions. And we're well equipped to do that because we have a lot of state information. We have velocities and accelerations, we have history. And so we can put all of this together with some smoothing and send this information to our application. Uh, and that, that, that essentially eliminates a lot of the latency. Uh, and uh, well, you get a chance to try it later. You'll see that it's getting really close to feeling like tracking matches reality. There's certainly more work to be done uh, on that, but I think we're getting close. Uh, and moving forward, one of the, of the big challenges for us is going to be to switch away, f to go move away from this external camera looking at the headset and looking into uh, room size tracking, uh, potentially using cameras on the headset to do the same quality of tracking. Uh, one of the big challenges in doing that lies exactly in this component here. Uh, we have to be able to, uh, to deal with a lot of uh, information that we get from multiple sensors, noisy information, and be able to filter it and smooth it and do good prediction so that the overall feeling doesn't break the, the sense of presence. Uh, just to give you some, some numbers, some, some data, so in this entire talk there's a little bit of hard information. This is the state of our current system. So we get very, very high precision. Uh, when I started working on this project, my first reaction was uh, Marshall's reaction from today. Pose reconstruction is a solved problem. So when I joined Oculus, I said, yeah, we can solve this in a month. Uh, and actually, all the components are well known, right, and have been solved in you know, dozens or thousands probably of papers over the years. But getting this level of precision wasn't actually easy, uh, especially with relatively uh, cheap equipment. So we get this type of precision at 1.5 meters. It, it turned out to be key because at the lower precision, uh, say uh, a one, one millimeter or two millimeters of precision, the entire wall jitters. Uh, this is even more important for angular precision. Uh, if you have anything that's uh, above 0.1 degrees of uh, angular jitter, it just feels horrible. The whole world goes back and forth. It's not an enjoyable experience. Our current setup works uh, up to a range of two to 2.5 meters. Uh, this will go uh, significantly, uh, will be significantly larger for our consumer version, so we're hoping to get to the range of, uh, of a living room. Uh, and the field of view of the camera is about 80 degrees uh, horizontal, which is, is just enough uh, for a seated experience, but it's not, uh, it's not wide enough to make it impossible to go out of the field of view. So that's also one of the uh, components that we're going to improve. Uh, and the latency that we achieve with, uh, with, with the ability to uh, do prediction, uh, it's not true to say that it's one millisecond, it's one millisecond before rendering. So on top of that, you have to add the time that it takes to render, which I think uh, is altogether about 20 milliseconds, right? About 25. 25, yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, and the vision pipeline I already mentioned is right now pretty fast. So that, that's one of the uh, requirements that we had to take uh, a very small footprint uh, on the CPU because uh, at the end of the day, most of the applications for us are, are games with a lot of 3D graphics, so they're not big fans of uh, computer vision people taking away their CPU and GPU time. Uh, well, the last, the last thing I want to mention is again that we're, we're trying to hire people in pretty much every research direction that we mentioned today. Uh, and we're open to a lot of different types of collaborations, so if you're interested or know anyone who's interested, let us know, and if you have any questions for us. Forget the number, but it's it's uh, somewhere close to 0.05 uh, degrees. A lot of yeah, you know a lot of these numbers. Well, everybody here knows that it's there are a lot of ways you can present your data, obviously, right? So there are clearly some edge cases where things are a little worse. For example, uh, on our headset, there are fewer markers on the side. If you're rotated all the way to the side and you're very far from the camera, it's going to be worse than when you're facing the camera and you're only a meter away. So uh, we're trying to uh, make sure that even the worst case uh, scenario still gives you a good feeling. And so these numbers are not necessarily the worst case scenario, but they're closer to the average uh, scenario. Yeah. 
Yep. So uh, somebody mentions um, long distance VR, and they're talking, you know, you need a few, like, maybe barely double digit milliseconds. Ah, but that's, that's not to turn around to the other person. Right. Yeah. Right. You, you know only need to see yourself. So if you um, move your hand, yeah. your avatar's hand has to move, right? But if the other person is delayed, you don't know that. Oh, that's a good question. I don't know. <laughs> I, and I think what I would say is, if the other avatar moves like a person would move, even if it's not how the person actually moved, you can't really tell the difference. Right. Yeah, but you can certainly, like, you know, cell phone conversations of with long lags. Oh, right? certainly you can't tolerate seconds. Yeah. Yeah. Um, or but even hundreds of milliseconds you can't tolerate. For those you can't. I think you could with this. Because what you'd have is someone's hand would be moving, and you would be doing predictive movement and smoothing the results, and unless it involves some intricate um, motion, it would probably be okay. But yeah, you might end up seeing people's hands go into walls or stuff like that. That could well happen. So is there a notion of how much latency is okay? For example, let's say you're dancing, mm -hmm. and you're wearing this, right? And you're actually watching the other part of dancing and so on. So you're not really stationary, and you're not doing smooth motion. <coughs> you're actually just going on. Maybe you're in a, in a vehicle or something, and there's turbulence. So what is the right latency there? Somebody has to move. So the only thing that I know is the amount of latency that works for, ver for rapid head motions in a relatively, um, relatively controlled environment. So you can move your head around like this, and it'll work at 25 milliseconds. Right. But what I don't know is I don't know what happens if you're observing parts of your own body. I don't know what the latency has to be on your hand, for example. Um, and I also don't know what happens in terms of interacting with other people. But the thing I'll point out there is you're unlikely to be in physical contact with those people. And if you're in virtual contact with them, if you know how to provide physical feedback from that, I would be very, very happy to hear. So that's, because that's one where you can't, if there were some kind of haptics and you could actually touch people, now the latency might have to be like one millisecond. I don't even know. But fortunately, we have to solve one problem before we get to the next one there. Yep. How do you envision virtual reality changing social dynamics? For example, like you could be in a conversation with someone which used to be like kind of like the last resort today of face-to-face -face interaction when like a pop-up or like if you can get email right there without even taking out your phone. Um, that could certainly happen in VR. Um, so, so I'm, I'm not, not sure, sure what the question, question is on. Do you think it would be better, worse? How else do you think virtual reality might change things like that? Oh. Well, I, I actually carefully avoided almost all predictions because it's so hard to tell what will happen. But if you're in a virtual space with another person and something can pop up that you can see and they can't, one of the really weird things there is that your, the software that picks up all your body cues and then decomposes them, transmits them, and reproduces them on the avatar could also be set up so that they can't see your eyes flick up to read this thing, right? I mean, it now becomes much, much more complicated. Um, so the answer is I don't know. It, go ahead. Um, so uh, because you don't know the orientation of the camera and your eye angle is tricky, um, you don't have ground truth. So how are you avoiding um, constant offset on this? <laughs> so uh, we, we know, know some things about, about, about the, uh, the, the, the there are certain some things where ground music is actually pretty good. good. One, One of them is that it's going to be most of the time. So if you're not moving too fast, I will probably get some things that are actually pretty the accelerometer, you can just have a shot of time. Uh, the uh, gyro itself is very reliable. So we get a pretty good estimate of uh, orientation, assuming that we figure out gravity. So together, uh, during periods of slow motion, we can nail down uh, uh, gravity. Therefore, we can figure out the, uh, the tilt of the camera. Does that make sense? OK. So the only missing component is yaw, right? And we just assume that the camera is facing forward. That's what's, what defines, you know, the forward for the camera defines zero yaw. Um, I, I can't help but thinking, um, you have a presentation that's great and it might be tuned to the audience you expected, but the number of the questions and the themes that you're talking about we really seem to need the um, contribution of psychologists, HCI people, 
So as a as a company or as a research group, is, is that part of your absolutely thing? Absolutely. I mean, specifically, specifically, I am here because we need computer vision people so badly, and this was definitely the place to come talk to first. But I mean, as simple as how do you interact with this thing? So one of the first things we learned is that if you put up a traditional HUD, same thing in both uh, eyes, superimposed on the world, it absolutely doesn't work. Because since it's the same in both eyes, the vergence is at infinity. However, it's in front of everything. So your distance cues are completely wrong, and it just makes people's head hurt. And so right there, how do you present information? It has to be in the world. And you also need to know what the parameters should be in order to produce the right first sentence. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, like I said, this is very deep. I don't pretend to know how far it'll go, but um, I don't see any way to do it without perceptual psychology as sort of the basis for everything. Now we're already have two on staff. So we, we, we realize that we don't know more than we do know. Um, what is the most uh, unexpected bug that you had that you felt just had enough kind of bug? <laughs> unexpected bug? Yeah. Uh, we had a lot of them. Uh, <laughs> <coughs> so uh, actually, th this maybe goes a little, a little back in history of this work. But when we started looking at position tracking, uh, <coughs> we were doing what a lot of people do, which is the uh, estimating uh, pose from a planar object. There's a lot of work on that, and it seems to be a pretty easy problem. Uh, and one of the things that we ran into, which is very rarely mentioned in the literature, is, is, is this problem of multiple solutions. Uh, it is, people realize that there are multiple solutions for three points, but not so much when you have, say, 100 points on the same plane. Uh, and it feels a little counterintuitive. This took us a while, and we even uh, ended up developing uh, a whole new optimization method until we came up with the solution of using the modulated LEDs and went away from planar objects. But this was one very, I don't know if it's a, if it's a bug, it was more a misunderstanding uh, that kind of took us a, lot, a while to research. So a parallelogram, for example, doesn't have the same ambiguity as a triangle. Mm -hmm. So if you had the LEDs in a, along the parallelogram, a rectangle or something, then the usual ambiguity for a triangle, which is away or towards you, that no longer exists. If it's If they're coplanar or not? Yeah, yeah it's a, well, it's a parallelogram, you know, coplanar. Yeah, well, there's, there's actually, if, if there, uh, there's an interesting research paper that, that proves that it's not true, that if you have even 100 points are coplanar in arbitrary uh, structure. There still can be multiple solutions. It's particularly the case in the presence of noise. Yeah, right? yeah. so there's an offset and the scale. That's always right. a problem. Right, so the main the problem is that, is not there. well, sure. But the problem is that you can have multiple solutions that are uh, that, that are not, not necessarily, the global minimum is not necessarily the right solution because of noise. And the two, if you have two, imagine two local minimas, one of them is the right answer. The other one may be very close. And then if you have even a little bit of noise, it could be enough to push you over the edge, right? Uh, and, and this goes back to all this notion of presence, right? We can't make these mistakes even, even once because it breaks the sense of presence immediately. Do you see a lot of variance in perception across users? For example, an implementation might make one person's motion sickness. Oh. <laughs> so so <laughs> I'm actually the poster child for motion sickness which is a little Wait, ironic. Not Brendan? No, I'm, I'm as bad as Brendan is. But uh, no, there is incredible variation in terms of that. There's one guy who I actually took the sea of cubes and spun it around him, and he said it was relaxing, where <laughs> for me, I actually started falling over, right? Um, so yeah, I think, the, I think the degree of emphasis people put on their vestibular ocular system versus the visuals is very different. Um, I think there's the sensitivity to strobing, to flickering, all those things. It's, you, all you have to do is try five people and you see it's a population. Uh, you mentioned body part tracking at some point. Yeah. Uh, so are, are you guys planning on putting a depth camera on the, the, kind of, on the front the facing camera? Because that's the, that seems to be the easiest way to do, achieve like, real-time body. Yeah. Because of the connection. I'm not sure you know, how, how much we know or can talk about future plans, but we're definitely interested in that. Uh, and I personally am not convinced that depth sensors are you know, necessarily the right solution to the problem, but it's, it's a solution and it's a problem we're interested in. Uh, you know, it's, it, it's one of these interesting problems where 
there are certain things we know we can do. If we really wanted to put this in the next product, uh, we could probably have some sort of body tracking, right? Maybe like Kinect, but we don't even know what is good enough for VR yet. So there's definitely a lot of research that's still missing. I can tell you the Kinect class latency is too high. Yeah. So a very rough thing, which I would not say is scientific <laughs> in the sense there's been a controlled study, but I would say 20% of the population doesn't get motion sick. 20% of the population gets motion sick and always gets motion sick. And maybe 60% of the population gets better, good over time. But you know, it's really very idiosyncratic and that's very rough. Some people definitely get better over time with exposure, most people. Oh, but one thing I should point out is that that's based on things like the DK1. When you actually have really proper stuff and you're only experiencing your own motions, I don't get motion sick at all. So if, it's, if I'm in a room and I can walk around the room and it tracks properly, it's fine because it's just like the real world. The question is what happens when I'm sitting down and I'm doing something that's moving me at 40 miles an hour through a hallway and, you know, then I'm going to get motion sick. Um, but so the ideal, of course, is just not to get people motion sick. And I think that that is, in fact, possible. Have you uh, considered doing any kind of bio biochemical modifications to prime users to be more perceptive or less perceptive or otherwise? <laughs> 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 I'm going to have you on. <laughs> no? Because <laughs> you might be able to change like, some of the latency expectations. So there's an interesting thing about headsets, which is that because you can't, there's no way to do depth of focus currently. Um, it's always at infinity. I happen to be farsighted, and so I see fine at infinity, so I personally take my glasses off and it works great. Um, however, there is room to put glasses underneath. Tight room. Yeah. <laughs> so if there are no pressing questions, I think what we'll do is I'll, I'll end the session. I think they're going to get the Oculus set up. Mm -hmm. Anybody is free to come down a lot. And I'm sure they'll also be sticking around for further questions. So we'll go ahead and talk. Thanks for coming. Good questions.